Hello and welcome to uh, another episode of CSC 280, the introduction to cybersecurity. Today we continue our discussion about access controls. In the previous video I talked about access controls and I introduced some basic privileges and just in case you need a reminder I'll link uh, to that video right up here um, on top of this video. The uh, topic for today is to start looking at our first access control model, which would be discretionary access control, or DAC, sometimes known as DAC. Um, DAC is, um, by all measures, by far, the easiest access control model to implement and the easiest access control model to use and operate. However, it does come with a number of uh, drawbacks. Before we discuss those drawbacks, let's figure out what we actually mean when we talk about discretionary access control. The concept of discretionary access control is that every object that is subject to that access control has an owner. And that owner is in full control of who has access to that resource and the nature of the access that um, that person has, the subject has to the resource. Sounds a little abstract, but think about a typical computer system, um, and particularly the file system. Almost all modern operating systems, when you create a file on a disk, assigns an owner to that file. Um, and often, depending on what OS you're using, it simply means uh, right-click and look at the properties of the file, and it will tell you that you are the owner of the file, you're the one who created it, and at that point creation equals ownership. Um, whether you look on Windows, whether you look on Mac OS or on Linux, each one of those assigns ownerships to files and as you create a file you are assumed to be owner. As the owner you have full access rights. You can do whatever you want with that file. You can make changes to it, you can copy it somewhere else, you can look at the contents, you can give it away to someone else, you can give someone else the rights to it, and all of those are access control privileges that can be delegated to others as well. The exact mechanism by which each operating system does that is a little different, but the concept stands. The owner of a file controls access to that file. And in most modern operating systems, a file um, is not just a bunch of bits on a disk. A file may provide access to memory of the computer. A file may provide access to a device connected to the computer, or it may be a network stream, or whatever it may be. All of those you can think of as files as well, and all of those the owner of the file can control access to. Now, in most operating systems, we also have a special type of user, which is the super user or the administrator. And even though you, as the creator of the file, don't necessarily give explicit permissions to that super user or the administrator on the system, they will have access to that file. So that's always something to keep in mind. There's always someone, probably on the system, who is external to the access control system and who can override those access controls. Technically, you say that's a violation of the um, principle that we talked about um, in the previous video, which was full mediation, um, but it's really not, um, because the, the exception is still enforced by the full mediation system, it's just um, an exception programmed into it. So, if the owner controls full access to it, um, that makes it really easy. I mean, if I want access to a file, I'll ask the owner, and the owner says yes or no. The problem is that it doesn't really scale very well. Um, a typical computer system doesn't have hundreds of files or thousands of files, it has hundreds of thousands of files. Even your own desktop computer or your laptop has so many files and each of those files has an owner and each of those files has access control associated with it. Under most circumstances you don't change many of those because they are part of the system and the applications that are installed on it, but if we look at the bigger picture view, at the system level view, um, it is uh, something that needs to be managed and needs to be able to be audited. And that's just on one single computer. You know, a, a reasonably sized enterprise network has hundreds, if not thousands, of computers connecting to it at all time. And if each of those hundreds, if not thousands, of computers has hundreds of thousands of files on it, 
um, and that potentially could be accessed by thousands of users as well. Now, if you start multiplying those numbers, all of a sudden it becomes clear that you have to potentially keep track of millions upon millions of different authorizations that need to be enforced by an access control system. And that's immediately one of the biggest drawbacks of the discretionary access control system. It does not scale very well. And even though it might work, um, it means that if you are in charge of cybersecurity, you will be having a very hard time getting a comprehensive overview of what access is granted within the system and who it's granted to. And if you don't know, then how can you attest to the fact that it is appropriate or that you can make changes to it without necessarily incurring side effects that you did not see coming? So discretionary access control, while it is extremely flexible, particularly for the end user, while it is easy to implement um, and easy to understand, it does not scale very well. And so that's the drawback there. The other part is that it's great that the owner of the file is the person who can give access to the file to authorize other access. But I might not trust everyone in my network to the same extent. And the discretionary access control model really doesn't account for that. If the assumption is that if you're the owner of the file, you're trustworthy. Well, you're the owner of the file if you created it. So is everyone who creates a file trustworthy? Huh. You know. So you know, think about what that means in terms of benefits and drawbacks. Now, what is interesting is we can we can get some level of visibility from the discretionary access control system. Um, we can create a matrix, um, and as long as we don't have too many users, too many objects, and too many privileges, that matrix might give us what we need for the very narrow case that we're looking at. So for example, I might have four people in my organization, um, and that's shown on the slide behind me. It's John, it's Mary, it's Sue, and it's Felix. And I only have four objects, which of course is not entirely realistic, but let's go with that for this particular game. And we might say we have a personnel file, we have purchasing records, we have contracts, and we have invoices. And so that means I really only have to worry about 4 times 4 is 16 possible combinations. I also distinguish a couple of different levels of control. I have an ownership control, I have read, write, create, um, and maybe delete. But I don't even think I used that in this example. Yeah, I did. Five. So I have five different permissions for my 16 different cells. So that's 90 possible combinations, 90 possible states that I could see in this network. And of course, that's, you know, with just four objects and four um, subjects, 90, 90 possible states is quite significant. And it scales, you know, pretty rapidly. Because if I would do this for 10 objects and 10 users, well, now I have... 10 times 10 is 100, times 5 is 500 possible states. You know, it, it doesn't look very good once you start scaling that to realistic proportions. But the benefit now is that if I can do this, if I can create one of those matrices, I can easily say, okay, what are the capabilities of, say, Mary? Tell me what Mary can do in my system. And all I have to do is look up the row and that dictates Mary's access and just go horizontally across it. And I can see, well, Mary can read, write, and create personnel files. Um, she can also read and write contracts. But Mary cannot access purchasing records, and she cannot access any invoices. Now, that gives me some of the capabilities that Mary has, and maybe I can make some assumptions as to what Mary's job is within my organization. The other hand, I can also say, okay, let's take a look at the access control on a specific object. So for example, tell me who has access to purchasing records. And I might see that John is the owner of the purchasing record, but I also can see that Sue can look at them. But no one else should. And so between the access control lists, which is the column, the vertical line, and the capabilities list, is the horizontal line, the access control uh, matrix, which is the um, part of the discretionary access control system does give me some insight, but again, it does not scale very well. Discretionary access control starts hitting limitations pretty quickly. Um, 
remember we said for example that we wanted our system to be able to do broad um, coarse access controls and fine-grained access controls and this thing cannot do that you know I have to do each object for each subject on a specific basis so be that as it may you know discretionary access control as easy as it is it does have some drawbacks next in the next video um, we'll talk about mandatory access control um, and it's a control model that you're um, familiar with but you probably mostly know um, from TV and from movies but we'll worry about that in the next video.